Dobri vece. Olam Mapasuba, Domoria de Telum Gudio Instituto. And I will continue speaking English because all of this conversation will happen in English. So welcome everybody um, to the third event of the series of inquiries into the future. Um, I'm glad you're here. We will have um, a hybrid event. I will say some technicalities before that. It's online and it's also physical, so it's happening here and will be streamed. I'd like to welcome uh, both of the curators, Inga Seidler and Anders Festalwey, who will also introduce our esteemed guests um, and give a short introduction into um, what we will discuss today and maybe also give a little bit of the frame of the series itself. Um, we also have a guest online, Marco Mero, um, who will be joining us uh, in a minute. So enjoy this evening and proceed. Thank you, Markus. Um, hello and welcome, everyone. My name is Inga Seidler, and together with Andras Shevalvai, we have been curating this um, event series here at the Goethe Institute um, as a curatorial tandem. And as Markus said, today is our third installment, and today we will shift the focus towards wasting relationships. That means to the relationships with each other, with other non-human entities, and our environment. And we will look into how these are, these are shaped um, by the systemic. That means how they are organized, for example, by the state, by infrastructures, and also by working conditions, labor conditions. Um, we will also see that those are oftentimes characterized as exploitative, and we will also ask ourselves what does that mean for possible futures? Our guests tonight, um, our guests tonight will discuss this, but they will also draw from their own practices and research from the fields of um, the curatorial, from academia, from activism, and from architecture. And they will also um, focus on the specific context between um, the East and the West and possible exploitative relationships there. They will also hopefully shine a light on possible alternatives and ways of resistance. Um, that would be very nice. And um, maybe some words also on the structure of the event. As Marcos already said, um, we will first hear an impulse talk by Marco Amiero um, on his publication Waste Your Scene. Marco is joining us via Zoom and from Italy. And um, the publication Vesto Scene has been one of the major inspirations also for the series and for this panel in particular for wasting relationships. Um, so Marco's impulse will, so to say, set the tone and will be a connecting element throughout the session. After Marco's impulse, we will hear two artist presentations by our guests Katalina Adodi and um, Miroslav Pastera. And they will give um, presentations on their work as curators, architects, um, activists, and authors. And they will talk um, about, amongst others, um, on how toxicity is often exported from the West to the East. They will talk about new logistical centers popping up all over um, Eastern Europe, these so-called um, steel cities can be also the steel landscapes, can also be viewed as emblematic for wasting relationships. They can be viewed as um, symbols of exploitation and power dynamics. After the presentation, we will then, of course, open the floor for your questions and also for the discussion with our panelists. Um, yes, but before we dive in and hear uh, Marco Amiero's impulse on the Ways to scene. Let me briefly also introduce him and his work. Um, Marco Amiero is an environmental historian, environmental humanities scholar, and political ecologist. He is the director of the Environmental Humanities Laboratory and the founder of Toxic Bios, an archive of personal stories of contamination and resistance at the KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. Um, Marco works on environmental justice and his research focuses on toxic waste, on migrations, 
on environment as well as on the city, science and power and ecological conflicts. With his research, he tries to bridge environmental humanities and political ecology. Marco Miro is also the author of numerous articles and publications, among others, Waste or Scene, Stories from the Global Dump, Mussolini's Nature, or a Rugged Nation. And since 2019, he is the president of the European Society for Environmental History, and we are very happy that he's joining us today. So welcome, Marco. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Such a pleasure to be almost there with you, <clears throat> more or less there with you. So uh, first of all, let's see if I am able to share my my screen. I, I think that I am now sharing my screen with you. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes? Because I cannot see you. If I'm sharing, I cannot see you. So you should tell me if. Wait, Marco. We cannot see yes. your PowerPoint yet. No? No. We can see your Zoom. Okay. Yes. Okay, I can try once again and see if we are more lucky this time. Let's see, I can do something here. I can do like this, this, and this. Maybe this will help us, otherwise I have also sent the PowerPoint to you. So if we are really struggling with this, we could Entire screen, window. Because what I can do is to share the screen, my screen, mm -hmm. and then open my PowerPoint. Can you see my PowerPoint? Now, now? we can see your PowerPoint. And Very now good. it's also okay, in sorry. presentation mode. Okay, sorry okay. for this. I'm also <laughs> you, starting Michael. the my timer, so I, I will not speak too much. Very yes. good. And I have my script on this side, so I am looking at this side. So respiratory failure due to COVID-19, no prior illness. The patient was in England in early March. He has had high fever and a lot of coughing. He cannot breathe and has tach tachypnea with a rate of less than 40 per minute. And the continuous need for oxygen. The patient needs to be intubated. The tube is in a position 24 centimeter verified with capnography and CBK in the artery. The patient, the patient has a temperature of 35.5 and needs blankets and blankets. He's taking norepinephrine. Sometimes the pressure plummets, but then rises spontaneously. Occasionally, opens eyes, grasps hands, and asks for sleep. The patient lost one kilogram in one day. He vomited in the evening. We increased the, the propofol, but the patient is very scared, started coughing and tried to sit up in the bed to vomit. The situation is critical, called the family. From Marco's diary in the intensive care unit, Stockholm. Because the waste scene, the age of waste, is never impersonal. It is not like the Anthropocene, the geological age of humans, stuff that you read about in books that the scientist on TV explains to you. The Westocene mixes with your body. Your, you breathe it into the air. Actually, many times, you start ingesting it as early as breast, breast milk. The Westocene enters homes, kitchens, and bedrooms. Of course, the homes of those who have homes. I wrote this book during my long convalescence. I became seriously Ill, Ill with COVID-19. I almost died. I said goodbye to my family over the phone because according to the doctors, I was, not, I was in, danger, in danger of not surviving the night. Why share with you, with strangers, here, more or less here in Bratislava, my cases, my illness, my hospital diary, 
well, a little bit to be less of a stranger, to get to know each other, apart from the official presentation, introduction, titles, publications I have done, etc., etc. As a scholar, I have always been told I am a not subject. I think that what I study and what I write about has to do with the personal, with my biography, my history. I wrote this book when I came out of the hospital after a month with 15 kilograms less, a strange voice doing, you know, a strange, a strange voice uh, from the intubation and strange monsters that show up every time night fell into my life and darkness brought me back into the coma in the ICU. How can I tell you about the ways to sin without telling you about this? I am not a private person, you may guess. You can find all these things in this book if you have the patience and the kindness to read it. My life is intermingled in the pages of that book. The disease pips through the page and through the toxic waste data. And in a way, my life is intermingled with the lives of people living far away from my life, people living in Rio de Janeiro or far away as in a global she in the gigantic electronic dump in Ghana. A primary school friend also resurfaces among the cardboards and among the pages of my book, standing in the poor night of a 1970s Naples to end up asleep this friend of mine in the class where I am also condemned to be the best in the class because, as my mother would repeat, and I'm quoting, for those like us with no saints in, the, in, in heaven, it is not enough to be good. You must be the best. All this is in the book. There are fragments of my life mixed with the history of my city and the history of the Westosin, the age of waste, which I want to tell you about today, because the Westosin, the age of waste, is never impersonal. It is not like the Anthropocene, something that you read about in books, that the scientist on television will explain to you. The Westosin mixes with your body. You breathe it into the air. Often, you start ingesting it uh, as early as breast milk. The Westosin enters into your home, kitchen, bedroom, of course, the homes of those who have homes, you might say. Everyone, everyone is digging. Some for one reason, other for other reason. BP, which would be the British Petroleum, but nowadays they call themselves beyond petroleum, digs very deep wells, even in the sea, in search of oil. Gabriel Resources digs in the pink mountains of Romania for gold. They dig up the mountains in the Susa Valley in Italy to run the high-speed train, the progress that runs as fast as an unuseless train, as unuseless progress. Geologists dig to find out if we were, if we have finally entered in, into the Anthropocene, the age of humans and where the unmistakable sign of our power as a species lies into the geosphere. It seems to be in the 1940s and 50s when the nuclear powers left their atomic signature written into the geosphere. But maybe it was with the Industrial Revolution, the Capitalist Revolution, the one without guillotines and Soviets, just so much, so much poison, war and misery. That, yes, a very clean revolution where you die without ever being killed. You fail in war, you fail on the job, you are victim of some gigantic industrial accident. But capitalism never kills. It knows how to behave well in society. And if one dies from capitalism, well, it means that she was not fit enough for it. What should we see? What would, what would we see if we could dig into people's, into people's body? What layers would come out? 
I imagine in the body of a worker, of a factory worker, we would find traces of the asbestosine and the traces of the CBMOCin, the vinyl chloride mon monomener, maybe the traces of the PVCOCin. For miners, we will find for sure the silicosine. For agricultural workers, the glyphosatocene. For all, for every subaltern, the wastocene the age in which capitalism produces people and communities to be thrown away, wasted communities, to be discarded, to be worthless, once every last drop of value has been extracted from them. When I speak of wasted communities, I mean multi-species communities, where humans and non-humans, uh, everything is turned into a mine to be exploited and then into a landfill, a garbage dump. Words are powerful. Anthropocene sounds, as, Anthropocene sounds so neutral, scientific, almost clean. You say Anthropocene and you almost feel like a scientist. So instead, we have to come up with new words that reveal and instead of hiding. Capitalocene is one of such war, important, powerful. Capitalism says that it is not a we, the human species, what has caused this planetary mess, but an economic system based on exploitation and oppression. The plantationocene is also a powerful war. It tells us that the current socio-ecological crisis originates in plantations, in colonial empire, slavery and racism. So much for the species. The Westocene points to toxicity. If the Anthropocene is planetary, disembodied, almost, you know, a ghostly narrative, the Westocene, on the other end, is about communities, bodies, and how a way of producing and consuming transforms everything alive into a gigantic socio-ecological dust. The Westocene, then, is not the age of waste found everywhere on the planet. It is not an, a, a, a jargon, an academic label employed to complain about the filth of our cities, nor is it another word to describe the familiar environmentalist nostalgia for some paradise lost in the past. In fact, I argue that the Westocene is as much about cleanliness and aseptic environments as it is about filth and contamination, because in, the, in its true essence, discarding, wasting, means deciding what has value and what does not have value. But the Westocene is not just about toxins, particulates, pesticides. To function, the Westocene intoxicated our lives and our stories, our memories. The Westocene is maintained by what I have called a narrative infrastructure made of toxic narratives. The Westocene toxic narratives silence or normalize the injustice. So the transformation of entire communities into landfill, in waste, eventually into cemeteries. Toxicity poisons bodies, ecosystems, communities, but also our stories, our memories, our imagination. The Westocene's greatest success is having convinced us that if you are poor, sick, jobless, if you live in a neighborhood where everything is falling apart, well, it must be your fault. It is not a system that produces waste, that makes you waste. Instead, being waste becomes an ontological characteristic. You are waste. You deserve to be waste. It, it, it becomes a quality of the person, of the community, of the environment. Can one detoxify from the waste to sin? Can we free ourselves from the toxic infrastructure that poisons bodies, histories, communities, relationships. Some, 
some even among us may be today in, in this room, virtual and real room in which we are, might say that we must inhabit toxicity. Philosophers and environmental humanities scholars have taught us that the world we live in, that we ourselves, we are all hybrids, cyborgs. Purity is an illusion, they say, a dream that looks so much like a nightmare, filled as it is with racist references. We must stay in the middle, within the troubles. There is life in the ruins of capitalism at its extreme edges. This is we, what we have been told by many and many scholars. Cert certainly, I do believe that all this is true. Yet, I don't know how to explain myself well here, but there is something that leaves me uncomfortable with this narrative. It might be that often those who say that toxicity is everywhere and purity does not exist, well, many times those often work in a university department and not in the cancer depart department of a petrochemical plant. Maybe they live in a house with drinking water in the Berkeley Hills and not in, the cancer, not in Morro da Babilonia in Rio de Janeiro. Maybe their sons and daughters, they go in some prestigious universities around the world and they are not collecting metals in a global ship in Ghana. So let's, me, let's try to be clear on this. I do agree that purity does not exist. I agree. And I do agree that we are all hybrids and cyborgs. However, I do believe that toxicity does exist. The Westocene is based on this founding principle and practice. Someone and something is to be wasted. And what matter is the separation between who and what is worth and who and what is worthless. And I have five minutes, so let's see what I will be able to, if I am able to wrap up. American writer, Rebecca Solnit has written what you can read in the slide, no? The basic message here is that it's the wall that does the paradise. You discover to be in paradise when there is a wall that is separating the place where you live from the rest. Per personally, I believe that what makes the garden is not the natural decay of capitalism, is not nature taking over the city, but the resilient communities fighting against the waste of sin, tearing down walls, transforming space of oppression and toxicity into communal spaces. If wasting relationships produce profits for a few through othering and extraction, well, commoning relationships produce communities through caring and sharing. The kind of garden I am talking about are not garden, those gardens are not born naturally, organically, because a factory closed up. Commoning is a project that goes through the bodies, affection, cares, and loves of humans and non-humans. It is like revolution, as if joy mattered, as if militancy were a close relative of friendship, as if we should be happy now and what is important is not who speaks better in a meeting, but who listens better. Even those able to listen, even those who cannot speak in our words, like the plants, the insects in a garden. I have seen, I have seen gardens flourishing. I have seen communities dancing around toxic wastocene fires. In Tuzla, Bosnia-Herzegovina, for instance, where women and men, workers, their neighbors, students, university professors, gathered together around a decommissioned chemical factory, a permanent dispenser of toxicity, and in demanding justice for those who become sick, so remediation, jobs, they also rediscovered that they were a community and founded the Worker University. I have seen a community dancing around the toxic fire of a cement factory in Can San Juan, in Catalonia, where fighting to breed a resilient community has reopened a theater 
another kind of garden, you may say, in which to cultivate the seeds of memories and future, and future, a future which should be free from toxic narratives. I have seen a lake come from the ruins of an abandoned factory in Italy. I discovered the history of Snia Viscosa while watching a music video by a hip-hop group, Assalti Frontali. The plant, this factory, worked from 1923 to 1954, producing synthetic fiber, rayon, uh, through the use of carbon disulfide, an extremely toxic chemical. After, producing, of, af, sorry, after production ceased, the factory remained abandoned for decades until the 1990s, when it became the target of several projects of speculation aiming at turning the industrial area into a shopping mall. As a movement from below began to mobilize to defend the area, occupying part of the buildings for the purpose of housing cultural and political activities, nature also appeared to raise up against the development plan, and even a lake started to appear. The story of, the, of, the, of this factory, of the Snia Viscosa factory, sheds light on the logic of the waste scene, and at the same time on its possible alternatives. Recovering what has been discarded, that is putting back to work, is one of the possible outcomes of the waste scene logic. From the ruins of an abandoned factory may well rise a shopping mall, but this is not what, but in this way, we actually are not challenging the wasting relationships that have contaminated the workers and their community. What really challenges the logic of the waste scene is commoning as a practice, because it creates a different set of relationships based on reproduction and care rather than on exploitation. And let me close here. I have only 18 seconds, so this is my, just my conclusion, I guess. There are tidy, clean, aseptic gardens, those, yet, th those, yes, protected by walls and gates, where life seems well preserved, like a frozen... F yes, I should close here, just the conclusion. Where life is well preserved, like, a frozen, like frozen food in a refrigerated tub in a department store. And then there are the commons. The space is stolen from capitalism, taken away from the toxic relationships between people, things, plants, animals, and if you wish, spirits. It is the commoning relationship that produce and protect the garden. It is not about celebrating toxicity or living or learning to live with it. And what would be revolutionary about learning to live with the, the oppressive violence of toxicity remains a mystery to me. Nor it, is it about learning to heal from toxicity as if it were an individual disease or a virus that has caught us. It is about freeing ourselves from it, the toxic relationships that construct the waste scene, that make profits for the few and the destruction of life. It is about sabotaging the toxic narratives that justify and invisibilize the waste scene. It is about imagining and practicing commoning against the logic of the waste scene. And as scholars, we can help, scholar, artists, activists, we can help sabotage the toxic narratives that normalize or hide injustice and bring out the resistant memories, the insurgent archives that tell the stories that no one has ever told us. Because the waste scene, the age of waste, is never impersonal. It is not like the Anthropocene the geological age of humans, stuff that you read in books that a scientist will tell you on television. The Westosin mixes with your body. You breathe it into the air. Often you start ingesting it as early as breast milk. Westosin enters in your homes, kitchens, bedrooms, of course, entering the homes of those who are lucky enough to have homes. Thank you very much. Sorry for being a little bit. So thank you very much, Marco, and uh, please uh, stay with us. Uh, I would like to now introduce our two other guests, and uh, uh, please remember your questions because uh, there will be a, a place for questions after 
all the presentations. Uh, well, uh, the can you remind me of the order of the speakers? So I, I Miro, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so let me first introduce uh, the first uh, uh, guest. Uh, originally, it was Katarina and Miroslav, uh, who uh, the uh, the writers, editors of the publication Steel Cities, and uh, Katarina is uh, uh, unfortunately sick, but uh, Miroslav uh, uh, is here with us, and uh, Miroslav is an architect. Uh, they both, with with Katarina, founded. Uh, a, uh, an architectonic uh, pro project, uh, and there were two other people, uh, Tadej Riha and uh, Martin Spichak. It's called the, the Logistic Landscapes Collectives, and uh, uh, they all uh, worked on this uh, publication, The Steel Cities, uh, which is a which is a, a, a book around the architecture uh, architecture of logistics uh, in Central Europe and. Central and Eastern Europe, uh, and I, I think uh, the best if, if I, I leave the introduction of this publication to Miroslav, uh, but maybe I can also introduce uh, Katalin, or I would introduce also Katalin Erdő uh, to you. Uh, she's a curator and a, a dramaturg, uh, also an activist, if I may uh, call you that way, uh, and. Uh, her, her focus is especially this kind of socially engaged art, experimental performance, and uh, uh, we, I like this uh, formulation, uh, artistic interventions in urban and rural public spaces. Uh, I think that this is an interesting uh, specialization. And uh, also beyond, the, uh, beyond her uh, artistic uh, involvement, uh, Katalin is also involved as an activist in groups that focus on Migration and, and labor-related issues. Uh, Katalin is uh, now working in, uh, in in Austria, so we will be ha having her uh, presentation afterwards. Hello, uh, thank you for introduction and also for the invitation, Inga and Andras. I will briefly present our project called Steel Cities, which was at the end um, a publication, but it starts already, uh, started already in the year 2018, and we worked uh, on this project together with my other colleagues, uh, Katarzyna. Lachová, Martin Špičák and Tadáš Říha. Uh, I'm not sure, yeah, I should turn it on. So. Okay, so uh, it doesn't work, but <laughs> we'll manage it somehow. Well, I'll try it again. Yeah, okay. Uh, so that's the, uh, that's the book. Uh, can you, uh, but we started uh, already sooner with the open call, which was um, prepared by the Prague Gallery Viper. And uh, the first part of the project was an uh, exhibition. Uh, um, and for us, it was actually um, the uh, like a good ground to explore or start exploring the complex subject of logistics and um, architecture of logistics. Okay. <laughs> uh, for, um, and we divided in a, in a few categories and point of views uh, to to also. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, and um, uh, after the exhibition, we um, starting to prepare uh, the book uh, Steel Cities. We uh, actually invited a uh, few authors to help us to uh, explore the topic, um, and uh, 
the book itself was divided in a three uh, three chapters, which was um, consists of the essays and photographic essays and maps. The first chapter um, was the city in the landscape. Uh, and uh, we were uh, like exploring the phenomena of the logistics center or this uh, cluster of building uh, set in a, uh, let's say, a landscape um, uh, close to the infrastructure as uh, airports and highways. The cities on map was for us uh, um, more like a um, uh, point of view as uh, on a logistic as a global phenomena, uh, the the whole like globalized world uh, and the the systematic of the supply chain and move movement of the part of this uh, whole uh, logistics machine and items on a on a planet, and the third part uh, was citizen in, uh, itself, like the, the, the people who are living close to these uh, infrastructures and the people who are working there, but also living there. It was actually for us really interesting to compare uh, to Germany that uh, in Czech Republic is actually possible to even live inside of the logistics center. So there are like few, it's, it's not that much cases, but there are few cases where are the dormitories for the workers inside of the uh, industrial area, and they are actually really living uh, there and working there on the same place. So the uh, the subject or the word landscape was for us um, uh, a word or buzzword to understand the architecture of the logistics. So the architecture of the logistics is. Um, somehow unarchitectonic or architecture on the periphery or also on the periphery um, of interest architects itself. So that was actually for us interesting to observe it, something which uh, looks uh, not really architectonic because it's uh, designed not by the architects but by the systematic of the, of the sy system and the uh, uh, logic of the of the movement of the goods uh, on the planet. And uh, this uh, photo is an um, uh, advertisement photo of one of the developers who also see the logistics center as a part of the almost bucolic Czech landscape uh, to sell the warehouse for the, for the clients to see how it's uh, like captured from the drone uh, Nicely set into these legs uh, close, you know, close to the German borders. There are like a um, few, or let's say it's um, two categories of, of the logistics centers. One is uh, the most, or like easier to understand, it's the 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 the, the uh, warehouse is close to the urban areas to the, to the cities and uh, which are actually uh, uh, are uh, some like a uh, logistical background for the city itself for supermarkets and boutiques in, inside of the town and there are also uh, Iceland like position logistics uh, centers they are they, they are connected more j j just actually to the to the kind of infrastructure like a highway or airport and uh, um, like this, um, until, until what is actually interesting in the region uh, of the Czech Republic or, or the Western Bohemia is that, um, that the condition there, that means uh, cheap labor and uh, the closure to the German borders make the region really interesting for the developers of the logistics centers. It uh, makes sense uh, from the logistics point of view, uh, travel with the goods, uh, uh, with the uh, train and with the, uh, on, and with the track 
to the Czech Republic, uh, from Rotterdam to Nuremberg to Czech Republic, uh, and uh, back uh, to the to to Germany just to um, just to arrange and and to divide the items there because the labor because the labor there is very much cheaper than in Germany. So it's uh, like these borders uh, from the past, like the curtain wall, uh, are still existing in and that they are rendering into these um, industrial areas. Uh, one of our case study was um, was uh, was actually the situation on the on the border and on a highway. D5 uh, on the way from Prague to Bavaria. Uh, from there you are in 90 minutes in Nuremberg, uh, Nuremberg or uh, in uh, two hours in uh, München. So that's actually the great, uh, uh, great uh, location for for the logistic centers. As I already told, uh, there is the the labor there is way cheaper. It's also uh, easier to actually build something randomly there near to close to highway, and uh, and the, the area or the region is quite poor and uh, poorly inhabited still. So there are these uh, island-like logistics uh, clusters, uh, and. Uh, this one uh, is close to the town Tachov, and I want to just show up how the landscape was um, changed, and actually also how is this kind of typology, or that, let's say that typology new, because uh, in the 90s they, they, they built the highway uh, to connect the Prague with the or connect the Czech Republic with the with the Germany, and uh, there were uh, plans how uh, it's possible to develop uh, the area or uh, the area close to the highway in a kind of um, naive way uh, because uh, the the actual situation nowadays looks like uh, this. And it's uh, not really, it's uh, t something totally different. And also new, the scale of the buildings uh, are very much bigger and uh, uh, to compare to, to, to the plan what in this slide. So for us, it was uh, this CT Park Bor, one of the uh, best uh, case studies. Uh, so we visited uh, this uh, uh, logistical park uh, a few times. The closest city is Bor and has like uh, 4,000 uh, permanent in residents. And the new CT Park Bor, the logistical uh, uh, park, uh, has like 4,000 uh, or uh, less, uh, okay, 3,000 workers, and it's getting bigger and bigger. And this is also the one of these cases uh, where it's also the dormitory inside of the park. So they built in like few years uh, the new steel city close to the old one, which uh, uh, which caused a lot of like. Uh, Problematic things also like uh, when like the inhabitants of the steel city or, or like these three thousand workers, there is lack of the infrastructure for the, for them. So it's actually the, there is a problem with the, with the school, or it's the, there is a problem to reach a doctor, and they are also like uh, in a, like I will maybe describe it um, later. Um, in this slide, there is actually the, the our it was our uh, uh, like uh, light motif. Uh, <laughs> um, the steel city, uh, the the 
the industrial uh, Julius Verne uh, picture of the of the um, dystopic um, town. Uh, our st cities are our steel cities are much more uh, basic or banal. And it has, uh, it's uh, usually it's just one story building, uh, basic envelope which covered uh, the whole um, system of shelves um, which is hidden inside um, together with the workers and with the um, uh, they look they are inaccessible but uh, <laughs> there are actually a few options how to visit them this picture is um, was part of the program we did, but it's actually official official uh, family day in Amazon um, in Prague. So it looks like uh, something totally like uh, also like dystopic or uh, um, absurd <laughs> in a way. Uh, but it's also it's actually interesting to to go there uh, and. Uh, like to try to understand how the how the, the, the um, company uh, like Amazon thinks about uh, what they are actually doing, um, and I want to like in the in the last part of uh, my uh, input is uh, I will speak about the citizen in itself. We uh, did uh, in a it was already part of the part of our exhibition. We did interviews with them, uh, and uh, also in the book, the last chapter is um, about the citizens and about the workers, but, and also this like border between um, like citizen and worker is really like thin in this case, as I already mentioned that they are. Living mostly really close to the to these uh, industrial areas in a like semi-legal dormitories. The work uh, is uh, also interesting. Well, it was for us interesting that we somehow thought that uh, in our time now uh, the work there should be or will be more like more automatic. Uh, and robotic, but it's actually really basic um, in our condition. And uh, as a worker, you are um, like the human body is still um, the the main instrument for for the logistic. Um, the the and the automatic part of the work uh, are actually these. Uh, Tools like scanners and hand gloves, uh, and uh, and you can uh, with the scanner you can read the barcode of the item, put it somewhere. But the, you have also the display on the scanner, and the, uh, it actually leads you through the shelves and say you hey you have to turn right and turn left. Uh, it's in a second shelf uh, and. Uh, in this way, is the work uh, automatic, but uh, everything what they are doing is doing by the human body, uh, and uh, and also the scanners. Uh, in few cases, it can track you and say uh, to the system, this worker is working uh, too slowly, or you can like uh, pick up points, and when you when you are really efficient. So it's also like a uh, kind of pressure on you to be productive. Uh, and uh, the workers also like trying to somehow hacking the system sometimes. So when they are need back, they have to like uh, made it uh, uh, in DIY <laughs> version from the, from the waste uh, what they found. Uh, there and we found it actually also like uh, quite poetic, but also uh, sad. 
And um, this uh, one is um, actually also the DIY thing uh, uh, in the in the restroom outside, uh, like to be like oh, keep from the cold from the, this cold bench. And uh, this is uh, the last slide from the from my uh, input and. Uh, uh, this is one of these like semi-legal dormitories close to the area. As I already mentioned, uh, the the biggest problem in this case or in the case board and in this uh, uh, areas close to the German borders, where are the lack of the public infrastructure is there that uh, you are actually in a difficult situation because uh, uh, in, a, in a region there are actually not enough people to work there so actually the people who are working in these um, um, factories or in these uh, areas are not just from, uh, from, the, from the region but there are also a lot of um, people from Romania or Ukraine or uh, from Slovakia uh, and um, this uh, migration cause that you have to be accommodate some somehow somewhere, and it's organized uh, very often by or mostly by the HR agencies. Uh, so the the deal is that the HR agency invited you to work somewhere. They they also organized the home for you, and you are actually also uh, employee of them. So they have a uh, like, uh, direct, uh, di direct um, impact on your private life and on your home, which is uh, super problematic. And uh, and um, I uh, this is like the, my uh, end slide from this lecture. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Miroslav and Marco and the system. Thank you for the invitation. And actually, your end slide is a very <laughs> good beginning for what I will start to talk about, because we will move actually not very far, because probably in the neighborhood, direct neighborhood, of these logistic, uh, uh, logistic parks are the fields, uh, like fields cultivated, so to say, by industrialized uh, uh, agriculture and uh, usually larger scale farms where also a lot of uh, migrant seasonal workers uh, are working. So I will start to talk actually first from the activist perspective and then depending on how much, uh, how well I do with the time, I will <laughs> also try to arrive to what uh, is possible uh, from like curatorial or artistic positions, like how we can tell other stories, counter stories or counter um, narratives, as uh, Marco also um, calls it in, uh, in his book, Waste the Scene. But first, uh, I would like to focus uh, on the situation of uh, seasonal agricultural workers. And uh, uh, maybe we can step back just one slide to the first slide. And also how we think about this type of work. I will be speaking from uh, the experiences in Austria, but more or less actually across Western Europe, as uh, probably many of you know, the seasonal workers in agriculture are almost exclusively migrant workers. And uh, they are usually migrant workers either from uh, like Eastern Europe, EU member countries or third countries, that's also a more difficult position for workers to be in, or they are illegalized uh, migrant, uh, migrants from Global South, mainly North African countries in uh, Italy and Spain. So this is, I think, a very important note because seasonal workers have very different status and this, of course, impacts on what are their possibilities for struggling against the uh, exploitative uh, working conditions or, or wasting relationships, we could also call them. And I would like to 
pick up on the discussion uh, that was very rampant during the pandemic. So, of course, in this moment, all of a sudden, seasonal migrant workers who were until then relatively invisible or invisibilized became essential workers, as also many other workers, healthcare workers, people working uh, generally in, in the care sector, also in, in home care, especially 24-hour care. So you probably also read, I believe, that as Slovakia is also giving a lot of such migrant workers uh, to Western Europe, especially, I think, rather in care work, uh, less in, in agriculture. So we all know that there was this great desire to uh, not let them stay at home and to mobilize them to, to um, I mean, to be able to go to work. And so there is this uh, ambivalence, of course, between essential workers and nevertheless disposable bodies. Because what I would like to talk about, uh, if we, uh, wait, I will try to click it. Which direction should it work in, actually? It's both, okay. So <laughs> I would like to talk about what are the possibilities of uh, organizing for the rights of agriculture workers. And there is an activist campaign in uh, Austria that uh, I have also been part of in the past years, which is actually a very interesting alliance between activists and a trade union. So in uh, Austria, there is a trade union in the sector of agriculture, also in other sectors which is quite strong, as uh, in Austria, the Social Democratic Party has been um, historically also quite strong. And perhaps interestingly, I mean, just so you know, I also didn't know this before, but uh, the farmers are mostly, so there is a so-called Bauernbund, a farmers association, which is extremely closely aligned with the ÖVP, so with the... Um, uh, well, how would you call it, Austrian People's Party, so the Christian Conservative Party, which is actually currently in uh, government or, uh, with a lot of scandals that you might have been following. So it's, it's actually a historical political tension <laughs> between uh, the farmers, uh, who represent quite a lot of power, of course, uh, in the countryside, and the workers, also the land workers, I mean, in this case. And uh, what Cezanneri is doing, as uh, most of the workers are migrant workers, we are trying to share information with the workers on their basic rights, because what's also very interesting is that in Austria, actually, their, the rights of agriculture workers, also in contrast to care workers, for example, are quite regulated. So there is something called a collective contract, which means that basic hourly wages in the sector should be guaranteed. Uh, but of course you need to know about this and uh, you need to be uh, knowledgeable about your rights and then we come to the fact that Austria, similarly to Germany, is a federal state and as you might imagine, uh, in each federal state, so in each Bundesland, there is nine of them, the hourly wages are different. So it also already poses the fact that most of this uh, information is available only in uh, in. Um, in German, so one of the important uh, achievements of Cezanneri together with the trade union is to create these small information booklets and, uh, and uh, share them with the workers. And then, of course, one must ask, how do we encounter the workers? As most of the workers are, of course, uh, not accessible, especially not accessible from urban spaces in which most of us, also activists, are mostly active in uh, urban context. So one of the other things that Cezanneri is doing is regular field actions. So this means that we look at what's the season in the moment. So is it asparagus? Is it strawberries? And then we try to map. It's a bit similar mapping exercises with the logistics centers. So we try to map, okay, uh, how, where are the fields? Where are larger scale farms that we could visit? And then either by car or by bicycle, we start like a, a day trip and start, try to look for workers. And I mean, of course, this is sometimes much more easy because uh, they work like a lot of people are working on the fields. If they are actually working in the closed off spaces, which are similar to the, but smaller in scale to the halls of the logistics center, then of course they quickly become inaccessible. And this is also where the alliance with the trade union becomes, uh, becomes quite strategic 
because actually the trade union has the right to talk to the workers. Activists do not have such a right, and also there are often with farmers discussions about trespassing, so it's not, uh, farmers are usually not very welcoming when we arrive with our information booklets. And I mean, another question, uh, issue is of course the language, and maybe, um, I will come to that later, so maybe something also to talk about because I think uh, it's a very small example, uh, but very, I think, structural and uh, says a lot also about how activism is structured. So for example, in Saisonary, there is a difficulty uh, of not having enough activists who speak the languages that uh, the migrant workers are speaking. So I myself speak Hungarian. Of course, that's uh, also quite essential. Romanian is, in, is, uh, Romanian is essential like uh, Serbo-Croatian Bosnian would be essential. And then we come to the fact that there is a privilege, so to say, that one must deal with in activism, that most of the people who can uh, afford the time to be active in such groups are actually German speaking. I mean, I'm just telling this because I think it uh, also belongs uh, to this story. So nevertheless, like with Cezonary, uh, next to the information booklet, uh, the campaign also produced little films in different languages, as well as like one small uh, artistic, or not small, but uh, like one artistic uh, result of the campaign was uh, uh, director uh, Frank Xavier Franz and uh, Lia Sudermann, who from the protocols that we make on each field action, of course, anonymously, did a documentary theater performance because of course uh, also a lot of this information i mean the information collected on the field is anonymous but it's important to intervene uh, in public discourse with information about the situation of the workers because uh, it's not so easy for them to to raise their voices so this is something of course that uh, it's not easy because although they are working collectively and in larger groups most often but often there is a language barrier also between the workers. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's uh, and also because it's seasonal work, of course the workers are moving. Sometimes they move from one farm to the other. And uh, another important aspect, and now I would just like to come to the pandemic experience. So of course, uh, many of these images you probably saw, this is the airport of Cluj when charter flights left for Germany taking uh, workers uh, to work on the fields. So these are also um, seasonal workers in la large numbers preparing to leave. And I, I think it's important still to encounter and not to forget these images because they tell a lot about how much we care for uh, the health and the safety of uh, one another and how ambivalent these pictures are when we think about like taking uh, also the organically produced uh, bio vegetable which is usually also harvested by uh, underpaid uh, seasonal workers so there was also i'm sure that you know many of these discussions so about uh, about how we think about uh, i mean the lives the bodies uh, the conditions in which uh, people are forced to move during the pandemic. And I think this is, I mean, immobility and mobility is always a huge uh, question, but I think it tells a lot, uh, um, yeah, like it says a lot also about the motto of, of staying at home. And, uh, and so, yes, so now we come to the temporary homes of, uh, of seasonal workers. I'm showing these images, uh, of course I'm showing them without people. This is uh, one of the encounters we had very close to Vienna, uh, like 30 minutes away. Um, uh, people who were working for a, a larger scale uh, asparagus farm were staying in such condition uh, for weeks up to months. And uh, these were also conditions that they were provided with during the pandemic. And I find it important to show these images because I think that uh, there is a relevance to seeing that uh, not only, <laughs> like not only knowing what is the, like how underpaid uh, very often these workers are, but also the fact that actually most of the time they have to pay for such accommodation. And uh, I think even in not pandemic times, this is uh, not conditions. So, I mean, also I think it's interesting to contrast. We didn't see so much about 
the academic accommodations that are provided by logistics centers, but uh, I think that this is a very, um, I mean, relevant contrast to, yeah, to <laughs> fruit and vegetable uh, production. Um, and now I would like to shortly talk about the difficulties of organizing. Uh, this protest that you see is actually a protest in Germany supported by an activist uh, anarcho-syndicalist uh, trade union. And here I would really like to make a case for anarcho-syndicalist trade unions because they are much more equipped than uh, trade unions that are more like uh, bureaucratic and uh, um, yeah, more uh, institutionalized uh, to support uh, workers. And uh, they are also much quicker to intervene Often in uh, Austria, also with the Cezanneri campaign, we have issues that, of course, the trade union expects workers to become members. That means paying a membership fee. When you are in an urgent situation, uh, you might not have neither the time nor the capacity to go through such bureaucratic processes. And uh, most of the time, of course, uh, sustainable organizing can only be achieved if, uh, if workers can organize themselves. And I think for this, the conditions of seasonal agriculture are, work, are very difficult. And of course, there is also, I mean, I just wanted to say that, of course, there's also a great history of uh, these struggles uh, in terms of, um, I mean, land workers' uh, movements and also tensions between uh, the landowners and, uh, and their workers, and uh, also transnationally, there is uh, a great uh, potential to unite workers, but of course, uh, the great potential is also the great difficulty, like across uh, distances, as well as language barriers. And uh, I just want to mention a few concrete cases from Austria. So the com accommodation that you saw, we visited because uh, one woman uh, from Romania, she decided to protest uh, against the bad working conditions and also against the bad uh, conditions in which they were accommodated. And she was trying to raise her voice, uh, which uh, was very interesting because uh, eventually she contacted the, the, the Romanian uh, newspaper that uh, is being... Uh, uh, like there is a Romanian newspaper in Vienna for the Romanian-speaking community, and one of uh, our activist uh, colleagues accidentally saw her writing. Because obviously, again, this is the language uh, question that if nobody reads it, like that is how we could reach out to her and get in touch with her. Uh, she raised her voice, she protested, uh, she got uh, compensated, she got financial compensation, but she did, of course, uh, lose her job. And the price of the financial compensation was that she could no longer speak publicly about what had happened. So this is, I just wanted to make this point because there is always this issue, how, do, how can counter stories emerge and uh, how are our counter stories or narratives being silenced and of course uh, the, like this structural <laughs> exploitation is working um, against the, uh, I mean, against breaking this silence. And another very important uh, conclusion of this case was that uh, next year, none of the, Roma like none of the workers of, from Romania were hired again, but uh, the farm where they were working hired the uh, workers from Turkey. So it's again like there is this, uh, of course, um, because apparently like the pool of, uh, uh, disposable workers or so this like there is an expansive character to to wasting relationships and uh, this I think this makes uh, the type of commenting uh, that uh, I also would find very important and that Marco was talking about uh, extremely difficult under such conditions um, I would like to very briefly uh, also come like I would now <laughs> switch uh, and uh, jump to Hedges hello Hedges Shalom might be familiar, it's very close to Bratislava, it's actually very near the uh, Hungarian, and I mean it is on the Hungarian-Austrian border, but it's like, so close to Bratislava that they have a housing issue with the fact that so many people from Austria and Slovakia are uh, like using it as a kind of uh, suburbia, which I also found uh, very interesting. 
And here I wanted to talk, uh, I was working here with the Independent Art Department, which is an art education initiative for university students in Hungary, self-organized. And they do regular like summer schools, summer workshops, always in different places uh, around Hungary. And we worked actually two times in this border town, once one year after the larger migration movements in 2015. And this was, uh, I think, in 2020. And I just wanted to trouble a bit, like, uh, who are our sources? Who do we encounter from? Who do we know about, uh, um, about different uh, local issues, which uh, are, of course, uh, also more broadly re relevant? And uh, here we did, uh, so the inside of the car that you see is actually the car of the Civic Guard. The Civic Guard, I don't know if you have it in uh, Slovakia, it's uh, existing since a very long time uh, in Hungary. It's a self-organized, like, uh, public, uh, like it's a self-organized security group, which is mostly active in rural communities. Often they do, like, voluntary border patrolling also, so they have been, uh, well, they're usually very, like, they tend to have, uh, they're very near the police, let's say, uh, in Hungary, like, also uh, organizationally very near, but still uh, uh, self-organized, and uh, they're kind of focusing on uh, local security and the disciplining of the, of the local community, and uh, I nevertheless found it very interesting to spend, so with the students we spent one day like sharing, learning about their work and uh, what they do, because uh, it's actually an extremely large scale organization and very widespread in rural communities and, uh, and it's a lot of people also join them locally, but it's a volunteer organization. So I was very curious to understand like uh, how how do they work and also what attracts people uh, to, to join this uh, group. And so we did a patrol with them and uh, this patrol revealed, so this is something I just wanted to shortly mention because it has to do with uh, illegal waste dumping. So it revealed one of the tensions actually on this border between Austria and Hungary is the fact that uh, Austrian, I mean, in Austria, it's more expensive to get rid of certain types of waste. So what people try to do is to bring that waste uh, in the dark of the night to Hungary and to dump it. So actually, one of the activities of the civic guards, among their many activities, is to be out in the night with uh, cameras that you use otherwise for hunting and to try to watch out for these uh, illegal uh, waste dumping activities. And I just wanted this image, of course, has nothing to do with illegal waste dumping, but I wanted to use it as a contrast because this is actually the private park uh, of an Aust like a doctor from Austria who also moved to the area of Hegyes Halom and uh, whose uh, land or whose park is also being guarded by the civic guard. So actually the civic guard gets sponsored <laughs> by many of the richer Austrian people, for example, who are um, living there for being kind of their private security guards. And I just, I find it interesting that there is a lot of uh, complexity in, in how they relate to, uh, to their locality and, and what they do. This is one of their, uh, like this is their office. And obviously they've installed like all the surveillance cameras, but interestingly that they didn't do voluntarily, but it was done by a company run by one of the people who is leading the civic guard. So of course there is also a lot of uh, like interesting entanglements there. But what was also very interesting for us um, that they do have an extremely active uh, community life. So this is one of the albums that they were showing us about the different like uh, like joint programs uh, that they've been organizing and uh, they are also the ones who like take care of local um, community events and build the uh, like the merry-go-round for the children so I, I just I find it very interesting that how within a local community one such group um, yeah can I mean be in a very like have a very ambivalent role but still be able to um, tell us actually a lot about what is happening uh, in, uh, in this very concrete 
local context. And I think that I, I'm, I'm like, I, I don't know if I have a bit more time. If, okay, okay, because then just very shortly, so I was trying to also connect to the theme of, uh, of like wasting relationships from different aspects. So this is also why I told the story about the, the civic guard, because I was curious, okay, who, who do we need to encounter to hear about such stories to, to gain knowledge? And also if these encounters, so that's maybe I shortly mentioned that something that's very relevant for my cu curatorial work is to really um, initiate uncomfortable encounters. So like to go outside of what one would consider our comfort zone and uh, to meet, uh, just to basically to to be open to meeting um, different people and different groups, um, not uncritically, but uh, yeah. So just, uh, but I think it's very important to to be in dialogue. And uh, one project that is upcoming, so I would just like shortly uh, like to introduce it, is a project that we are working on between Germany and Hungary with the NGBK and. Um, it's called Neue Gesellschaft für the Kunst. It's a self-organized uh, art organization in uh, Berlin with whom we are doing a two-year artistic and curatorial research called Salt Clay Rock, which is focusing on the politics of nuclear waste and also energy futures. And I mean, this is just very interesting because of course, in a way like uh, um, in waste scene also, uh, Marco often talks about the fact that waste uh, might smell, of course, but uh, like there might be a stink, but I find it interesting that, of course, uh, that's not the case for all types of waste and nuclear waste in the sense, in this sense, is extremely abstract because it's underground. It's, uh, yeah, it's probably most of us have never, I mean, we'll never encounter it, hopefully, in our lives, but, uh, but it's nevertheless, it's there in huge quantities and it will be impacting our environment for several thousand years. So we also here have to deal with the very, um, I mean, the notion of deep time and uh, a kind of temporality of uh, waste and also potentially uh, wasting relationships uh, that's here to stay. And we are looking in uh, both Germany and Hungary uh, also at existing uh, nuclear waste repository sites. So one of them is in Morsleben. And that's maybe also just very interesting to mention, like how do these sites come to be? In Germany, one is in Morsleben, the other is in Gorleben. They happen to be on the two sides of the East German and like the former border. And it was kind of a, like a competitive, like they were, they were embodying this uh, antagonism across the border. But of course, while this is the larger, like the higher level of political decision making, going for the kind of antagonist competition of building nuclear waste repositories, it's impacting on, on the local communities that happen to be um, on the border. And, uh, I mean, what for us is very relevant and also connects to the question around the politics of remembering that, of course, uh, like uh, there has been, I mean, there is a very important history of anti-nuclear movements in Germany. It's better documented in, in Hungary less, but nevertheless existing. So one of our goals is also to look at how we can go back to these histories and archive them better. Like this is one image of a, uh, self-organized protest camp, the so-called uh, Free Republic of Wendland in uh, Germany. And this is an image from Hungary from the late 1980s. So one text that I was reading about this protest against nuclear waste repositories, this is in a small rural community in South Hungary, was that actually it started this kind of democratizing, self-organizing procedure before the this is before the transition happened in uh, 1989, and uh, it was supposed to be at that time a very relevant moment. And interestingly, this moment has been forgotten while many others are remembered. And I just wanted to show this slide. This is uh, on the facade of one of the municipalities talking about radiation levels. So of course there is again this abstraction of how do we perceive this risk? How do we communicate about this risk? Is this number even a valid number? Nobody knows, but there is a performance of, of uh, transparency, let's say. And this is also the interesting thing, uh, and this is my last 
slide in uh, like regarding the German situation because in Germany I think uh, a few years ago they made the decision that they cannot export their nuclear waste so they need to find an end repository and there is also a certain ambivalence around the fact that uh, they started the very so they started the very strong in, uh, information campaign and the kind of democratic process to discuss where should this final repository be um, but it's of course ambivalent because who, who would want to <laughs> have such a, a final waste repository and also what does it mean to be transparent about such questions while and maybe this is just the last comment to connect back to the situation of um, Russia's um, like war on Ukraine but also ongoing relationships between most uh, European countries and Russia is the fact that Russia is reprocessing a lot of uh, like uh, waste from uranium mining and actually there is still transportation of this waste to like so there is still <laughs> despite I mean all different sanctions this area has not been uh, not been uh, impacted and uh, yeah, I think it's also interesting to know or not to know what this exactly means uh, also for communities in, in Russia who live in closed cities. So obviously they have even less chances of talking. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Katalin and Miroslav. Maybe you want to join us again in the front. And we also would like to see if Marco is still with us. <laughs> So we can actually open the floor to questions to all of you three joining us and of course also uh, with each other. Marco, <laughs> can you still hear us? Are you still with us? Hmm. I hope so. You should hear us. Right, Marco? Okay, that's fine. Um, is there any questions? We have also a wandering mic that we can pass around. This should also work. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Um, all right. Maybe then to, to start off this conversation, because I realize that there is actually a parallel in all of your works and research, is this process of collecting um, narratives, of collecting information, also making it public, um, the archiving. And I also wanted to hear a bit um, about this process of you, um, from you, Marco, um, especially with the Toxic Bios Archive, if you could elaborate a bit on that, because I see some powers in your practice. Yes. To, you, to tell you the truth, it's, uh, it's not always so easy to hear from the, from the room. But uh, if, I, I, if I understood correctly, you were asking me about the Toxic Bio Archive, right? Is that yes. something that... Hear you, but you're frozen. Hello? Marco, can you still hear us? Y yes, <laughs> okay. more, more or less. Right. And I mean, it... no, I was asking, did you ask me about the toxic bios archive? Right? Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Okay, okay, now I can hear you very well. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, this is a project that we started, I don't know, I think almost uh, six, seven years ago. And coming into environmental justice and discrimination and so on and so forth. Many of us uh, were at the lab, at the Environmental Humanities Laboratory. We were doing our oral history interviews with you know, our communities and so on and so forth. And then we realized that perhaps we could try to get 
those interviews, those oral history together. But in a way, I believe that the inspiration of this project was the main issue, uh, one of the slogan of the environmental justice movement, at least in the US. No? One of the slogans says, uh, We speak for ourselves, you know, to translate somehow their stories. We decided to actually ask them to tell their own stories. And um, the, the other, the other, uh, the other pro the, the other aim of this project was also to to challenge, uh, at least to challenge a bit the authorship uh, dilemma, because. The problem is that as a researcher, as an academic, you know, you do, I do research, I publish, and so on and so forth, and it's always a little bit, you know, you reproduce, you reproduce the kind of, you know, one-way relationship between the researcher and the researched. While with the Toxic Bios archive, but also with other experiments that we did, I can say a few words in a moment, we try to to challenge this and try to give actually the authorship to have a more shared authorship of the research that we were doing. Uh, everything started with a book that I published back here in Italy with the title in Italian, Teresa e le altre, which in English would be something like um, Teresa and the other women. And it was a collection of nine uh, oral histories uh, from uh, female activists in Naples. Again, the idea was to, to change the authorship uh, paradigm. So it's, the book is not my book, it's actually our collective book. We are all authors of that book. Uh, and after the book was published, many other activists contacted me and said, OK, I have a story too. I want to tell a story. And I want to be part of the book. But unfortunately, the book the books, they, they don't work in this way, right? When you finish a book, it's, I mean, you can do a second edition, especially if you are very famous, which is not my case, I guess. But it's not so easy, you know, to expand the book. And the book cannot even be an encyclopedia because it doesn't work, I think, so well. So the archive was also an answer, at least an attempt to answer this demand, be part of the project, even if, uh, so having something open, like an online archive. We have been criticized. Uh, somebody said that uh, the methodology is very weak. We didn't have, we don't have the, how do you say, the skills and the background to decide if Caterina or Marcus are actually sick or not, right? We don't have this. If, if, uh, if uh, Thomas will say to me, okay, Marco, you know, I am getting sick because of this chair, it's not that I can run a blood test with my amazing lab and decide if it's true that the chair is somehow making Thomas uh, sick. And this was a critique. But I think that what those people didn't understand was that we were not looking for, you know, replacing the, 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 the kind of work done by medical scientists, you know, art science, art science researchers and so on and so forth. We, we believe we believe and we still believe that people can feel to be sick and to live in a contaminated uh, community. And this is interesting enough to sh be shared. Also, because many times when people are able to share this, actually some good research can be done and you might discover that it's true, there is contamination, there is toxicity. This is what happened, for instance, with asbestos, with workers, this is what happened in many other cases with sources of contamination. I don't know if I answered the question. Yes, thank you, Mark. Is there uh, somebody who would like to ask something, a question, or a comment? Because uh, what I was thinking a lot about is, is, is still this uh, uh, 
like the, the geopolitics of nuclear waste. I, I was quite uh, intrigued by this. Uh, especially, yeah, I think even right now uh, Slovakia is importing uh, Russian uh, nuclear uh, fuel. So it has this interesting uh, connection that even if, even if the gas imports uh, were at some point uh, stopped or at least there was a, there was a trying, but there is still this, I don't know how other countries are uh, in this direction or if, uh, if there is anything we can tell about this. Uh, it, it is just, uh, for me, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting moment that, that it, this is such a geopolitical, uh, um, really relevant game still, I would say, that because it's been so long. Maybe I, <laughs> yes. I, I tell you what I know. I also don't uh, know uh, enough, clearly, but um, there is uh, actually quite interesting uh, activist organization in Russia, Eco Defense. They're one of also the one of the oldest, uh, like um, environmental organizations in Russia, and uh, together with uh, with other like uh, it's usually German and Dutch uh, environmental organizations because that's where the ships leave from. So. There is actually a lot of calls, like uh, either, so it, the, um, actually the, um, the traffic is, goes both ways. So there is uh, incoming traffic from uh, Russia in terms of, uh, um, I mean, now I don't, I don't know if it's nuclear fuel, like that's, I'm not exactly sure. I know that the, like the outgoing is, um, is waste from uranium mining for reprocessing that somehow, I mean, that's also interesting. Um, like that all these categorizations of waste are also changing. So for example, as far as I read, uh, this is no longer considered nuclear waste. So, so also because certain uh, waste you can export and certain waste you cannot. But of course, if you, like I think there's a lot of negotiations also around how you label the, <laughs> the waste. So like how, what then enables this uh, waste to be able to leave the country or, or not. And I mean, I also think that it's interesting from the German perspective that actually this decision to really have the end repository for nuclear waste in Germany is relatively recent. So, well, if I can I jump know. in yes, the discussion, course, it seems to me that apart from beyond the issue of wasting, wasting relationship and you know narratives, maybe there is another uh, object uh, which I, is a. Uh, is recurring in our uh, presentation, in our practice, which is this, uh, the issue of borders, frontiers, in a way, no? There's a lot of crossing borders. This, these borders that are there are permeable, but they are also very, you know, actually performing something. In my own, how can I say, understanding of the wasters in logic, the border is always a border is a, you know in the Rebecca Solnit, Rebecca Solnit kind of you know framework, the border is the wall creating the the creating the garden, creating the paradise, and uh, in a sense, I don't know, I don't know if this some something that you are also um, if you have been also reflecting on what is the you know the performative role of the borders in which way sabotaging the border is actually also a way to sabotage the wasting relationship. What is transiting and what is not, what you can, what and who can actually move through the borders. For me, this is a big question, for instance, to, the, to, the, to a very you know, popular discourse now on the human exceptionalism which is something that I completely, you know, I, I share, I understand. I, I do see the spe speciesism of putting humans at the very center on the, on, and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, I have a dog, and this dog has a Portuguese passport. And I can tell you that this dog can travel around Europe and hopefully also across the ocean, this is what I hope, um, easily. So I wonder, are we talking about the human exceptionalism or about a 
North, Global North Exceptionalism, who, who is the human in this narrative? And what is the border in this narrative? And maybe I would like to respond to you uh, on this, because I think that, I mean, there are very different borders, and I also can sometimes, uh, I mean, especially in the case of uh, migrant seasonal workers, often re reflect on the on the notion of the border from Gloria Ansaldua, who said, uh, I didn't cross the border, <laughs> the border uh, crossed me, so to say. I don't know if I'm now quoting quite accurately, but what I found, for example, very interesting that this woman who I mentioned, who was protesting and then received the compensation, and so who, like, I'm not making a case for human exceptionalism, but also like, who is human where? So when she returned to Romania with this financial compensation, uh, she renovated her home. So, you know, where is this garden and where is the fence? And, uh, and uh, so what situation, so what, how is she dehumanized in Austria, but at the same time, like, uh, renovating? I, I just found it also quite um, interesting to know that, of course, she returned home and she invested this financial compensation in making a better home for herself, like uh, also uh, in contrast to the conditions that she has to live in when she's working. So, of course, uh, it's, uh, and in Romania, hopefully, you know, she has better conditions to be a human than in other situations where she is uh, more disposable. Like, it's also a recurring element. I don't know if, but perhaps this also connects that, um, seasonal workers when they become ill they are sent home so they don't stay they don't uh, they don't receive any uh, like yeah so they go they have to go home it's I, I find it also interesting I mean of course it's uh, the essence of being a migrant as well that uh, you might be sent home or you might be expelled from the Schengen zone as well if you for example if your employer doesn't take care of your papers uh, so there is a like you're constantly being moved as well, not only moving by choice. So maybe I have a, a, a question which is a, a, a bit uh, more general, but I think it reflects a little bit on some of the things that we've been talking about. And it is uh, the main topic of actually this whole program is why we were thinking about the inquiries into the future as a multi-level inquiry is uh, so we have some kind of diagnostics we found some problems there is a moldy bathroom of these workers and there is a, a clear uh, there are measurements of uh, red radiation but but was uh, our first question is so okay where do we start uh, uh, where do we start with dealing with all these problems in the world? Uh, one of the kind of the ma major counter argument uh, to the nuclear waste problem is that is a that it is a transitional uh, energetic solution, uh, uh, and uh, also what does it mean if we? I don't know how we, how to even formulate it, but. What if the supply chain of these uh, logistic uh, cities stops? So, so, so my question is, uh, and of course I don't think there is an easy answer, or if there is any, but where do we start? So, um, in our case, uh, actually, we start with a description. Mm -hmm. uh, so, the description of the, the of the problematic. It was also for us it was actually the part of. Uh, mapping and photographing the phenomena was uh, the starting point uh, to understand or to deconstruct the problematic of the whole system, which is layered from the global um, from the global problematic to the super local uh, uh, problematic of the building. Uh, behind your homes or like uh, on, on, your, on your backyard and uh, like uh, uh, also like uh, to uh, trying to explain what does it mean when this um, 
architecture appeared at the, uh, your like uh, close to your home uh, because um, this is part of the the like um, global system that you can't really like understand but you see the parts of it that, that they are this, uh, like appearing uh, close to the highways and the cities so we started with uh, with the with the observation but uh, also like this uh, like um, logistic or the architecture of the logistics is, um, uh, is something w what you can touch but it's uh, actually also like fluent uh, or like a fluid uh, i mean because uh, when the condition change and it's again like the question or problematic of the borders the political borders between uh, czech republic and uh, germany exist but uh, almost doesn't exist uh, difficult to say now in these times but uh, but it is uh, like uh, ec ecological and economical and uh, others like conditions and situation are still there which uh, um, making the conditions for something as a logistic center creating the borders again like uh, the logistical centers are actually also part of the is border. It's part of the wall rendered by the by the borders to the to the Germany. But the conditions can like easily change because it's all about like global supply chain, as you thought. And now we are dealing with a lot of problems. Uh, um, as, uh, as already started with the pandemic and uh, the problematic of goods or like the distribution uh, of the masks. It, it's like it was like the the chain was uh, from one day to the other broken, and uh, we had like uh, enough of something, but lack of something what was super important for us at that moment. So when this uh, condition change, uh, also the architecture like move out and it can be like uh, situated in um, somewhere else on the on the planet, and uh, the residuum of of this building what we are. What I uh, showed in the presentation, there will be like there as a like a change, a changed landscape or something like like there will remain the areas of asphalt and uh, concrete in a, in a, in a, in a fields close to the highway, but they will be probably not used or maybe we will find solution for reusing it. It's like this. A, like new layer of the of our like activities. So I don't know if I uh, like uh, <laughs> like uh, answered uh, what you thought. If, if someone want, but maybe I have a little bit like a, a, a little follow up on it. So. What I also meant by where do we start is because I feel that we started with these very personal stories and went to a kind of abstract solution. But if you have any ideas for a also personal kind of solution, like do we have a chance of um, rejecting atomic energy at the moment? Or do we have a chance of rejecting the logistic system? Or, or what? Uh, of course, one of them is, is helping these people. That is, a, that is one of the obvious uh, things that we can do. But also, is there any systemic uh, answer to these problems? Katarina. Hello. <laughs> do you hear me, everybody? Good evening. Great. Uh, I'm not sure if I heard your question pretty well because of the sound conditions, which are somehow disturbing, but or disturbed. But uh, what I wanted to add to Mira also is that the logistics works as a system, and uh, usually the system is uh, quite uh, in, a, in a great scale. It's it's almost like a global system. The goods are traveling uh, through the whole uh, globe, etc., and the uh, companies who are, who are uh, operating the system are exponential, etc. So it's, it's a huge system, and what we learned uh, during our sort of 
research is that if you if you want to try to fight it somehow, even in the local scale, uh, it's better to somehow mm, make sort of network as well. Uh, for example, in uh, in uh, central Bohemia, there's a cluster of uh, huge uh, warehouses uh, quite near Prague, actually. And there were some locals, and uh, they started to fight these uh, developers and uh, the state because they do didn't want to. Basically, they didn't want to have another huge warehouse uh, behind their house. It was a kind of a typical Nimby fight, let's say. But there were, there were uh, in the beginning, there were just few, few local people who were protesting. And afterwards, uh, uh, they uh, gradually connected with the municipalities of the small villages, which are located next to these uh, logistic centers. They connected with other activists from the area. And in the end, there is quite a big, let's say, network of villages, of the municipalities, and of the people, which consisted, consists now from about 15 uh, municipalities and, I don't know, four or five civic uh, mm, say organization which are, uh, which are self-organized. And they're located, located around the D8 uh, highway, which connects Prague with uh, Germany. And they are now in a more, in a better position to, to actually uh, speak with the authorities, speak with the developers, because yeah, they are becoming bigger and bigger. So, and also this uh, appears in a, in, a, in a field of uh, organization of the workers as well, because uh, yeah, you have to you have to work transnationally, let's say, to, to be somehow uh, successful. Uh, yeah, according, uh, yeah, there are some cases like the Amazon yeah, workers and, and etc. Because uh, yeah, it's quite quite difficult, to, for example, in Czech Republic to organize uh, uh, in, in uh, one. Uh, uh, let's say, warehouse, because, uh, yeah, but if you connect and if, if the people connect uh, or connect uh, to the different countries, uh, there are some uh, organization which operates on this level, it's, uh, it's I think, necessary. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's my comment. So, so if I maybe, uh, if I understand it, it is in some kind of collective action. Some kind of collective action would be answer. Uh, for the moment it seems that our time has been uh, fulfilled for today. Uh, however, it is not the, uh, the ultimate end. We would like to invite you for tomorrow's workshop, which is the continuation of this event. And it will be with Ivana Rumanova. And tomorrow at 10 in the morning, we will be meeting at uh, former Istropolis, now a built site. Uh, and Ivana will be ta talking us through about how it uh, came to that this important architectural site is now being demolished. We will probably talk about what will be there, what are the compromises, how we deal with, uh, well, how we deal with the uh, the, the past, how we deal with the current asbestos, and many things. Uh, you are invited. There is a text that is like a suggested reading. Some of there are a few print printouts for this text, but also if you if you give me your email address, I can send it to you. And you are all invited. Uh, Oh yeah, and we meet at uh, this former Istropolis, or it is also called Ternavske Mito, which is like one of the big cross crossings. There is a under walk, a, a place, an under passage, and we will meet there. Uh, even in case of like a not very good weather, we will meet under this place. And at the end, we will also visit a retro. Uh, 
Naipe, or how to say it, a, an interesting place uh, which we also remind us something about the past. So uh, this is our invitation, and I would really like to thank you for all our precious guests uh, online and, uh, and uh, in person. So uh, thank you, Katalin, and thank you, Mirek. And uh, also, thank you, uh, Katerina, for uh, joining us. And, and Marco, thank you very much that you all found time to be with us and, and share your thoughts. Uh, is there anything you would? I think there's nothing left to say. But again, big thank you to all of you and hope to see you tomorrow in the morning at 10. <laughs>